right. The date is January 27th, 2010. We're at the Glenview Public Library. We'll be interviewing John Mettler. Uh, interviewees today are Matt Moore and Julia Skolstad, along with Mr. Rhodes. Uh, Mr. Mettler, you enlisted in the Army. Why did you choose to enlist and why the Army? I chose to enlist because I was going to be drafted anyway. I wasn't a good guy. And uh, the judge said to me, did you ever hear of the U.S. Army? <laughs> so uh, I felt if you're going to go into the Army or go in, I, I wouldn't go Navy because Navy was for, I, don't, I, I want something my feet on the ground. And I didn't want to go in the air because I, I want to touch ground. So I, I went in the Army because uh, I went in for three years because I figured if I'm going to spend two years, I'm not going to get a choice of what I'm going to do. So I might as well go in for three years and do what you want to do. And see, the Army, will, they'll, the military in general, will guarantee you a school. You enlist, we'll send you to a school. They will not guarantee you what's called an MOS, that's your job. So let's say they send you to a school to be an electrician, or like, who knows what, a radio guy. It doesn't mean you're going to be in radio. Only if you succeed or exceed in the schooling they send you. So I went in and I took uh, heavy equipment. I always loved tractors, cranes, bulldozers, and stuff like that. And I wound up acing that class. And then they put me, then they cut the class in half and they got rid of those guys and they wound up carrying a gun somewhere. And then they put you in another class. And then I aced that one again. So then they took us 20 people out of that and sent us on to our MOS to see. So, it was to my advantage to enlist, not to get drafted. Now you talked about you went to school to train for heavy machinery. What was that training like? Like was it mostly academic or just focusing on? No, it was hands-on. I mean, we were at uh, engineering school in uh, Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and you're 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 working on the rails. I mean, it's, it's bulldozers, cranes, tractors, diesel engines, generator sets. Uh, pumps, anything that you would see around a construction site, and how, that's what. How long was this training for? Like it how was long uh, the first one was six weeks, and the last second one, first one was a heavy equipment re, uh, maintenance person. Okay, and then you moved on to a heavy equipment repairman, which is more like a more sophisticated. The first one was six week, or it was, well, it was more now. I think it was like eight weeks, ten weeks. And then the repairman, I think, was like six weeks. So you went to training, and then was there a break period between when you went to Vietnam, or were you sent right away? Vietnam, I went. The first years I spent, after I got an engineering school, they sent me to a ordnance company in Fort Riley, Kansas. Well, there's ordnance and engineering are two different things. So I didn't have a job there, other than, because they have ordnances like tanks, uh, jeeps, um, deuce and a half, stuff for that infantry would, would use, see? And I'm an engineer guy. So I wound up sitting around there, and they sent me back to Belvoir again for an ordinance class for fuel and electrical systems, so I could get another MOS. So I had like three MOSs. And uh, so when they sent me back there, I aced that class, so they sent me back again, and they still didn't have a position for me, so I hooked up with the battalion commander, and I did artwork, and I drew pictures on the front of the village of uh, not the village, but our our main whatever building, uh, pictures of jeeps with blown injectors on it, and all kinds of weird stuff. And I painted the hall, all the uh, cartoons I painted in the mess hall. So him and I got along great. And he was an infantry guy, and I knew he was an infantry guy. And he says, Get, paint, "Paint me something for my room." So he came. <laughs> He came up with, I came up with this picture where it's all these people in stuffed shirts and dress blues at a party, cocktail party from ordnance and all these other uh, signal corps and all these slushy type of MOSs. And then in the background, in all full color and everything, I had the door opening and he was walking in with his infantry helmet on and a gun and he's full of mud and everything and he's just grungy and everything. And in the bottom line I put underneath there, it says the infantry adds color to what might otherwise be a dull occasion. 
he loved it. He just flipped out. Well, from that day on, we just got along. But then, finally, the SEAL wanted me out of there. So then I wound up going to Vietnam in the last year of the service. So you wound up in Vietnam in 1968? 68, 69, yeah. So that was the beginning of the Tet Offense? Yeah. How did you guys feel, like, beforehand? Would you guys feel, like, safe, like you guys were in control of the war? I had no idea what we were in for. You ever see a movie, Platoon? Mm -hmm. Okay, you ever see the opening scene when they drop the back of the C-140 and they walk out on the car mat and there's, you see the, the waves of heat and the dust and he's looking around and there's coffee and the body bags there? Mm -hmm. That scene was written by somebody who landed in Vietnam because that is the most accurate depiction I've ever seen of what your first impression is when you step off a plane in Vietnam. You're talking like 110 degrees, you know, all day long, and, and the heat and everything, that, that was the first, that scene was so accurate as to what it was like. Was that movie accurate, or do you feel like The movie was accurate, yeah. There, there was a lot of things there? in there. I think it was typical of what would go on. There was a lot of infighting sometimes, and, and people just disappeared, you know. And, and I wasn't in infantry, don't get me wrong, but uh, I knew people were, and that kind of stuff did happen, you know, where people would just get, go out on patrol and one came back and another one didn't, you know. If you had a grudge, you didn't have grudges against people if you were in the infantry. I mean, <laughs> everybody's got a gun. <laughs> and everybody's smoking dope. I, I didn't, I tried uh, the, the weed for a little bit, but uh, no, nah, it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> So no, we had a we had a platoon. It was called yeah. the asphalt platoon. I was a, we were building road, bridges and roads and everything, but we had an asphalt platoon. If you were the biggest deadbeat in the com company, that's where you wound up was in the asphalt. Those guys you'd walk into the we had these bunkers in the ground with forty ton of dirt on them, and we living in fighting bunkers we call them. That's where we lived. And you'd walk in there. I don't know where these guys got this stuff. They had like psychedelic lights and everything, and they were all high and. The, just like in Platoon, where yeah. you go in there, that's exactly what it was like. I mean, they're all high on dope, and they got the pipes and everything, and, uh, and the smoke and whatnot. Well, that was the asphalt platoon. I mean, that, and that's a lot of other ones, too, but more of the asphalt, all the deadbeats wound up there. Were there a lot of drugs in Vietnam? Like, I know in no, Platoon they had some, and then in American Gangster they get cocaine. No, no, no. It was just uh, uh, marijuana grew everywhere. So, and, and people would just smoke it because for nothing else, it just relaxed you because you get so stressed out and it depends on your frame of mind. You reach a point where you feel eventually that your number's up. If your number's up, your number's up. So you're willing to do anything and you know, it doesn't seem to bother you. Now you said that you build roads and some other stuff. Could you describe your duty in, Viet in Vietnam? We was. I was one of four people, you have a battalion, and a battalion is broken down to four companies, A, B, C, and D. All right, I was attached to the 35th Group, uh, 577th Engineers, and I was an A company. In A company, we had four people, me, I was on a, on a, me, two guys on each field service truck. It's like a truck that goes out and fixes anything. And our job was, us four, was to fix anything and anything that nobody else could. It was like rock crushers, uh, asphalt plants, industrial engines, generator sets. We were assigned to fixing that stuff and keeping it going. And they were building the roads, you know, or the bridges and whatnot. But we had to go out at any time, anywhere, under any conditions, and fix this junk and, and make sure it works. And uh, so it was kind of like an elite little group because it kind of like Dictate. You ever see a movie, Kelly's Heroes? No. You ever see it? You gotta see it. You gotta see it. What are you missing a good movies? It's my favorite movie. But that's what we were like in Kelly's Heroes. We were just kind of like, did our own thing. We had our own like Donald Sutherland, you know, like wow and everything. And uh, I had an American Indian that was with me on the truck. And uh, we couldn't go anywhere without a salty dog. He had to have gin and grapefruit juice all the time, you know. And, and he, I don't think he ever got out of Vietnam because I remember when he, he didn't get his papers to get out, he used to dress with a little, you know, like Indians would wear a little wrap down here, you know, and, and he'd have his hair cut like a mocha. I mean, he's a great guy. Working, 
He's smart and everything. He jumped up on the seal's desk and do, was doing a war dance on his desk, <laughs> demanding his papers so he could get out of country. I don't know if a guy ever made it out of there, but but a great guy. But there was us four, and uh, the other two guys would call them AC and DC. It was like Laurel and Hardy. So we had kind of like did our own thing, and, and they left us alone because, you know, they didn't. Uh, we had a colonel come and mess with me one time because we came in with solid state equipment they wanted in an asphalt plant and I threw it down down a well and uh, he got all upset with me and he said Mettler I want you to go find that thing I told him I threw it in the car but they had like we haul stuff to a hole in the ground somewhere and they dump stuff so he told me to send me over there to go find this stuff and uh, <laughs> Of course, that was a blessing because we were all junkers. So here we went to the garbage dump for the whole day and picking up shell casings and all kinds of other souvenir stuff. So uh, it was unique. It was a unique job. I don't regret it. Unfortunately, there were there were people I know that that were real real good friends of mine that got killed because they didn't do what we told them to do, and that's sad. You know. What would you say is your most memorable mission when you would go out and fix something that no one else could? Like, was there something that stuck out, like, because the machine was unique or because there was under a lot of pressure? I mean, the first, well, like, everything was because everything wanted to be moved right, right now. I think the most, the one that sits in my mind the most is when a rock crusher went down. I probably wouldn't be here today. In fact, I know I wouldn't if I didn't. The rock crusher went down and I was up there replacing the jaw on the thing and it's a hell of a job and you're all by yourself you know and uh, the chief was over in another area and um, I was so tired that night I decided to stay and I just fell asleep in, under the rock crusher it so happened that that night this is up on a hill and then down on the bay was where the, the bunkers were at and it so happened what they had done, the, 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 they let these Vietnamese on base to do laundry and stuff like that. Base is nothing but some dirt hole. But anyway, they let them on there. And what they had done, they put satchel chargers inside the bunkers. And then at a certain time that night, the Viet Cong were up in the hills and they started lobbing mortars in on the base camp. Well, everybody that was outside the buildings charged into them because they had some more protection in there. They had, well, they had like sandbags around and everything. Well, at the time they went into the bunkers, the bunkers exploded. So we lost like 20 guys. And I would have been one of them. So if it wasn't for that rock crusher. <laughs> was this the only time that you were under fire? You weren't really under fire, but were you under fire any other time from the vehicle? We were, we were since, since we were building a road, and supposedly, I, we were building like a road, Burma Road through the mountains, almost like straight up. And we were actually, I think what the Viet Cong felt is that we were actually improving things for them when they later take over. Mm -hmm. So they would harass us. They would let us know. We'd get shot at, guys would get killed, but they wouldn't be any outright assaults. Um, I had my truck blown up. That was another close one. I just, I got out of the truck, I was gonna walk back to it, I was so tired, I felt like I'd just fall asleep in it, and I figured, nah, let's go back to the hooch. And I got about 30 feet away and got hit by a rocket. And I, I, I don't know where the picture's at, I thought I had it in this butt, but it just <laughs> it took it out. But if I, there was another thing. And after you do that so many times, you get the feeling that you, you tempt fate. You figure you're invincible, because you're gonna die, you're gonna die. So why? Why? What's there to be afraid of? Let's just get it over with. So and that's that's after you have a number of those things happen to you, you feel that you know not that you're invincible, but that when your name was coming, it'll come. Did you did you do anything for good luck, or was this just? No, no, I didn't wear anything. A lot of guys wore all kinds of stuff for good luck and whatnot like that. But I just we had we were at, when we were Central Highlands. We lived at a bar, our bunkers were at the bottom of a of a 200 foot earthen dam of water on the other side of the Japanese built in World War II. And uh, the guys that were new there, we had a guard tower on the top. Now you could, I mean, you could talk about a turkey shoot. I mean, if you wanted to hit somebody, that's where you were. And with the greenhorns that came in, they always sent them up there for guard duty. And I, if I was a new guy, I'd be scared to death. But I would go up there and I'm driving down this dam. Now anybody could shoot me with anything. And I just did it. 
and I went up there to make these guys feel like, you know, don't be afraid, you know, it just, it, it took some of the edge off of them, you know. But. Where exactly in Vietnam were you? Were you in the southern part? I was in a place called, um, it was an air base, I came into Cameron Bay, which was like in the southern, uh, middle of the southern thing, and then I got sent down to a place, to a, a, a base that was outside of a big air base called Tuiwa. And then from that base, we weren't in Tuiwa, we were down south of there. And then from there we got, we worked up in the, in the highlands or up in the mountains, a place called Vungro Bay, where ships would come in and they would unload the fuel for the Tuiwa air base. And then six months later, we finished that part of the road and we got moved up into the central highlands where it's, you're way up there, you're like 1,800 feet up. And uh, we built, uh, uh, made out a quarry up there and we started building the road going up that, up that hill or up that mountain. So did you guys stay with the same four guys the whole time? Well, two of them phased out and then two other guys came in. So I, I always stayed with them. Uh, for the whole time I was there, you know, there were guys that were there already when I started and then there were guys that left, you know, had the time in and they left too, so. So are these lasting relationships that you... Um, yeah, I mean, we kid along a lot. I mean, you, you, you didn't, it was sometimes hard to get close to people because when you do and then something happens, you know, you just, uh, yeah. but, but we had, we all were on the same thinking thing, which was the interesting thing about it, is that I'll never forget the time when well, the generator blew up and the printed circuit board smoked. And, and we're all four of us are sitting around the circuit board and we're looking at it and we're trying to think of some ways to bypass this thing so we can get this generator going again and get power down there because when dark comes we have no lights or anything. And so we're all kind of on the same, all coming up with the same ideas and everything and it was so funny because here comes the colonel, and he's cussing and swearing, and he's, he, need, he knows we kind of like, we're like mavericks, and, and he comes up the hill with all these dictates, what's wrong with it, what's we gotta do, how come you're not doing it, what are you sitting here for, what are you, why don't you do something, you know, what's the matter with that thing anyways, and, and when he said that, it was like magic to all of us, we all said the exact same thing at the exact same time, we all said, it must have got hot. And he just, he exploded. He just, <laughs> that's not what he wanted to hear, that it got hot. <laughs> and he kind of cussing and swearing. He says, you, you, he says, get that damn thing running. You know, I got court martial all you idiots, you know. <laughs> but see, we knew, we, we kind of like did what we wanted, you know. We get it done, but don't push us, mm -hmm. you know. Now, how did the Tet Offense affect you? And then, did it affect you at all? Um, we weren't near a big city. Tet Offensive was mainly to take control of the major cities. Again, in other words, Vietnam was a political war. I don't care, I don't know what they teach you kids in school about it. That was the most political war there ever was. We had no business being there. It was a total waste of human life. I mean, the whole history of it was simply the French owned it, or sent the French occupied it before World War II. After the Japs kicked them out, after World War II, the French felt, oh, let's go back and continue on where we're at. And the Vietnamese wanted self-rule. They didn't want that kind. So they had a right to have their own kind of governing, whether it's communistic or what, who cares? But they had a right to have that. So the French got kicked out by the Vietnamese, and so we're gonna go in there, we're gonna, we're gonna take care of this. So, well, you don't fight people on their own turf, especially since they've been doing it forever. And there was no way, no how, we could ever want that war, no way. And, I, and everybody said, oh, Nixon, the big, oh, he's such a crook. Let me tell you something, Nixon was the greatest president next to Ronald Reagan we ever had. He got us out of Vietnam, and you know why he got us out of Vietnam? He says, no, we're not, we're not dealing with this demilitarized zone nonsense. We're just gonna bomb the hell out of you. And that's what he did. And that's what he did. And that's what ended the war. And, finally, and, we, and then he said, we bombed the hell out of him. He says, well, we're gonna quit. Or we're done now, we won, you know. And that brought him back to the table and they came up with some Mickey Mouse agreement or whatever. But the Vietnamese, the Arvans army per se, uh, they had no interest. 
they had no interest in fighting that war. You see what happened after we left. They, the whole place collapsed because they had no interest. They just wanted America to come fight their war, just like we're doing in Iraq and Afghanistan right now. So I don't like getting that. So you are clearly anti-war or anti-Vietnam War. Did Absolutely, you? because because you don't understand until you're there. I was it took once you're in country for about I would say a month. You knew what, you knew the story. Mm -hmm. You knew what was going. On. There's no way you got to defeat these people. I mean, I could tell you the stories of the guy with the axe. I told her about it. You know, cutting the steel. I mean, here's a guy. We go through the hamlet every day. Uh, to go up to the mountain, and he's got a three-inch steel plate. Now, I don't know what he's making, a bomb out of it or whatever. He squats. Everybody squats in Vietnam. They, they, nobody sits. They, nobody stands. They squat. They do anything out of every squat. And he's sitting there with an axe. Now, the axe is made of carbon steel, so a little bit harder than a mild steel plate. He's chipping away at this plate. He's doing this every day, every day. After about six months, he got this far into that steel plate. Six months. Now think of the determination involved there. So I felt sorry for him. And we're, we're leaving, going up to the other place. And I says, uh, I pull over to him and I says, uh, draw me where you want. Where, where do you want this thing? You know, all I know, he's making a bomb to kill, you know, GIs. I don't know. So he draws me a square thing like this. You know, all he wanted was a square out of his plate. So I cut out, I get out the acetylene torch and I cut the thing off for him. Made his day. And then we got down the road. And I got thinking about that, and I says, you know what? I just ruined that man's life because he has nothing to do now. He has absolutely nothing to do. But think of the determination to spend six months. It's like the guy in jail with a spoon and a nickel where he makes a ring by tapping on it. Just think about that. And you think we're going to defeat people like that? You're crazy. There's no way. There's no way. These people were so determined and resourceful, they could make anything out of anything. I saw a guy making an axle for an lambretta on a pedal lathe. I don't, know, lathe you know, I don't know if you know what a lathe is for turning a piece of steel and you machine it down. He's got an axle. He's making an axle. I got like an old Singer sewing machine pedal thing, and he's turned it down. And he'll be doing that for months, but he'll make an axle. You can't, uh, you can't defeat people like that. How did you feel about the campus? Uh, like There were some campuses that protested, and then... The government used violence against these. How did you feel about those, like Kent State, for example? I, I, in some ways, I have to side with. You know, it's all hindsight now, but at the time, I, I, I disagree with it. I mean, because at the time, we all thought that Vietnam was right. We always thought we thought the war was right. And, and if you don't like it, well, you've got your freedoms. And your freedom's gonna come at a cost, whether you like it or not. And if your military or your, your, if your government at the time has a draft, and your obligation is to go serve two years because of this draft, then that's your job. That's why you have the freedom you have, is because other people before you did the same thing, and they died too. And they didn't want to die, or maybe they didn't want to go, but they did, and that's why you got your freedom. But now when I think back on it, I say, well, I, it, it was also pointless. Um, there was a lot of protest music. W did you listen to any of this, or did you feel that no. you were with it? No. I was too busy working. You know, you know. I wasn't a college kid. Never went to school. The problem with college kids, they have too much time to think. You know, they should be working more. And when you work more, you don't think about things like that. Um, what did the military, your military experience teach you about your outlook on life, outlook on the military? The military, it, 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 a lot of people were sent, went to the military because they thought it was a dumping ground to, to improve this guy's whatever, his attitude and whatnot. Like a lot of judges would send people into the military and the military would take them. Of course, nowadays, we don't want the derelicts and the bums. We want somebody that's got some smarts. But uh, the military, it, everything is, you only get out what you put in. And, you know, like I say, going to the school in the military, if you don't put, we had guys, all they did was goof off. Well, they wound up carrying a gun. Not that, you know, if I had to carry a gun, I'd carry a gun. But 
I felt my talent didn't deserve a gun. I still carried a gun, though. And I still was shot at. <laughs> um, do you remember the day that your service ended? Uh, no. I remember coming back from Vietnam. Um, we went. We landed in Seattle. Now you gotta remember, Vietnam and the lowlands was like 110, 115 degrees. I mean, you your body acclimates, and after a while, it's like nothing, you know. But uh, and then we went up in the Central Highlands, and it was like 95. Beautiful country, by the way. And we were wearing field jackets. We were so cold. And then. But when I came back, left there, and I landed in Seattle, it was 60 degrees out, or 70 degrees, I thought I was going to die. I was sitting in the air base. I was freezing. In the, and I really, you know, we're all going like that, you know. But I had a chance to go back there. See, we had civilians that were taking over our jobs, and they were bringing civilian earth moving equipment, cats, whatever, huffs, and whatever, but they're built to well, just like you see out on the road, construction job here. The military had their own military version, although it was close, but they had 24 volt systems and all kinds of other stuff. So I had a letter to go, a recommendation to go right back there to where I was as a civilian. And at that time, it was 1200 bucks a month tax free. That was a big chunk of change. And you had, you had nothing to spend it on. You just send it all home. And I got back to the United States, and all I had to do was hand it to this guy in California, and I would have been right back to where I was again. But I got back in the States, and I said, I want to go home. <laughs> um, did you pick up work right away after fighting, or did you take some time off? To... No, I went right back to where I was. I worked, I, I worked temporarily to help this guy out in the garage in Skokie that I was working at. And then from there, I was sitting in a coffee shop with a friend of mine, and he asked me, we both went through Vietnam together, and he said, uh, he said what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I said, I like earth movie equipment. I said, I saw a bulldozer on a bridge in Evanston, and it had a patent sticker on it, a patent tractor. And uh, he says, well, yeah. He says, well, my cousin is the shop foreman in the engine shop over there. And that's where I wound up. Um. Did you form any close relationships with your fellow comrades? And... Uh, yeah, because we all, we had to work as a team. You couldn't have, how do you call it, animosities or anything. You couldn't have any, uh, you had to work together. And when you were four people and we had to, we were under such tremendous pressure to get the stuff fixed. And, uh, uh, you, 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 would, you, you, nobody was any better than anybody else. You were, everybody was open to somebody else's idea. And, and I think that's why we worked so well as a team. Did you join any veterans organizations? No. No. Do you have like one, one story that's most memorable to you or are they all just off there? Oh, no, there's a million stories. But I mean, it's just, uh, you know, they're all unique, but uh, I, I think the one with the axe was the one that really, uh, that was one other one, uh, what was that other goofy one? The one with the guy with the trail. We were building this like Burma Road, and this guy, Ren, went out on his, on his truck, and I'm talking a big truck, and uh, uh, this guy, in six months that I was there, managed to unbolt that rear end, put it on a Lambretta, take it all the way down the mountain to the local town or whatever, had somebody rebuild it, took this thing all the way back up on the mountain and put it back in this truck with no tools, no special tools, no nothing. I, I did save one picture of this guy with this truck jacked up. Not a picture of him, but the way he jacked it up. He put a bottle jack on top of a rim with a four by four on top of it, and he's underneath this truck. I could have sneezed and it would have knocked this thing out of there and killed him, but that's, the determination these people had, you know. Uh, the other thing that impressed me more than anything else was the Koreans. You don't mess with the Koreans. Uh, the Koreans over there were probably, I would never want to confront the Koreans. 
they were the hardest fighters that anybody I've ever seen. Um, we had one Korean, he went flying through a hamlet, he killed some guy, some Vietnamese, who knows, whatever. He brought it over to our, we had a little machine shop thing there, and he brought it over there, and he was all excited and everything, and I said, what, I'm trying to understand what he's saying. And he's telling me, you know, here's hair and there's blood and flesh on the bumper, and his fender's bent up on this thing. He was more, he wanted me to straighten the fender, which I did for him, but then, the way I understood it from him, he was more concerned about that Jeep being dented. He didn't care about who he killed. He did, that Jeep was going back, and if it went back dented, he was in deep trouble. So I got to know this priest who was a, there was a French orphanage there, and these are kids that abandoned and whatnot, saddest thing you ever want to know. So when I got some time, I'd go there and fix their roof and do things like that. So I got to know this priest who was, um, kind of like heads up this place, or he'd go there and help. There were French nuns that ran this place. And it really run down, supposedly for an orphanage. And um, so he took me out to the Korean base one time, which is down the coast for, from us. And, and they had some big thing going on. He says, just come on along, you know. So I go along with them, and we get on the base, and he had that, like this training center. It was like a, oh, almost like a big flat area that was built up and they had almost like these, they built like their own little pagoda or whatever they call it there, you know. These guys are beating the hell out of each other. I mean, they're just, I mean, the blood's flowing. This is not uh, WWF, this is the real thing, you know. And they're killing, I says, what do they do? They take like prisoners and beat them up or something? He says, no, that's the way they train. I said, whoa, you know. Then we had a, we, I was, I was had guard duty one time. And then there's this tremendous firefight breaks out right on our perimeter. I mean, it's like 100 feet from us. And the tracers and the bullets and the stuff's going back and forth. I call him and I says, well, what should we do? And the guy says, don't do nothing. And I says, why? He says, it's the Arvons and the Koreans. And I says, wait a minute, they're on the same side. He says, yeah, but the Arvons got in their way on a night patrol. They wiped them all out and continued on their way. You don't mess with the Koreans over there. Serious stuff. <laughs> Do you have anything that you'd like to add that we haven't yet covered? Is there something that you want to say on camera? No, I there there were good points and bad points. I of course I you know I came back in one piece, but then later there's a thing that's come back to haunt a lot of veterans, and that was the Agent Orange issue. Uh, for instance, my brother takes care of a guy who was uh, special forces. He was a, a, a ranger. He was in Cambodia, and they dumped Agent Orange on him. Didn't think nothing of it. Uh, that guy is virtually a vegetable now, and uh, my brother takes care of him. They go to the VA all the time. It took him forever to get the VA to even acknowledge his problem. And one of the problems was is that he was in Cambodia. Well, we weren't supposed to be in Cambodia. So there were no records that he was in Cambodia or he was anywhere near Cambodia. So they just kept backtracking and wouldn't do anything about it. Myself, I had uh, prostate cancer when I was 50 years old. Nobody in my family said, well now, Vietnam, if you're in Vietnam, if you have come down with any one of 10 different diseases, it's because of Agent Orange. We didn't know what we were drinking in the stream. We didn't know what, nobody gave it any thought. Well, now I've got it, and it's in my genes. And uh, I don't know if you saw this thing in the Tribune, it was like a month ago, where they talked about the guys who, were, who he had Agent Orange, he's got nervous issues and mental things and everything that happened to him. His two kids have it, just like I have. It's in my genes now, this dioxin. So my kids are going to be susceptible to these diseases too. I mean, that's not a pretty thing, though. It's not something to think about, or, or not something that you want to, you know. And and they're finally the VA is admitting to all this stuff, and that that's, that was a sad, uh, you know, sad ending to it all. Where people were killed that I knew. I had a young guy. I told him. I says in Vietnam, roads were beyond anything you ever seen here. I mean, we had chuck holes this deep every 10 feet. And when, when you saw a smooth piece of dirt, you wanted to get off that road so fast. But the first, that's where the, bomb, where the mines were at. 
So the first thing you told everybody, a new guy in country, is don't ever drive where the road is smooth and whatever. You take the worst possible thing. Well, this guy he just got married, kid on the way, and uh, he was in country about maybe a month, and he did exactly what we told him not to do, and he got killed. Nicest guy. I had a guy get killed right next, I, we went out, he was standing right next to me. And, and I says, come on, let's get off, let's get off the truck around. And I nudged him and he's, he took a bullet, went right, came in right through here and hit his heart. No, he's just sitting there. Yeah. So, I mean, guys who are in infantry will tell you much worse stories. There's no question about it. Uh, we, we were, we had a special forces base camp that was up the hill from us. Those guys got hit every night. I mean, we could see them charging up the hill, the rockets, the motors, and everything going on, and we just watch it, you know. But they, they kind of like left us alone a little bit, and uh, just to let us know that we're here, but you know, don't. Uh, I mean, it's <laughs> strange country, beautiful country in the highlands. I mean, there's people I know that have gone back to Vietnam to see where they were at. It's wonderful on Google now. I mean, it's scary, it's spooky. I can go on Google and I can zero in right where I was. And it's just, there's that dam, there's where we are, there's the rock quarry, there's the road we built. It's so funny seeing that though. But uh, the lowlands, there was nothing to see there. Just nothing but, in the highlands too, the other interesting thing was insects. You know, you see dragonflies here. They're like helicopters over there. I mean, these things, you get hit by them, they knock you over. I mean, everything grew big in the Central Highlands. I don't know if it was the humidity or the, or the food or whatever they had to eat there. Because see, on the lowlands, all the Vietnamese had was, was fish and rice. You know, that's a hell of a diet. You know? But they all had the beetle nut smile. The beetle nut smile was, you know, you smile and you just saw black teeth. Well, they chewed on something called beetle nut. It was like a sugar or whatever. They just ate all their teeth up, you know. But that was, but then when you got up in the Central Highlands, well, they got a little more meat on their bones up here. You know, they're, they're looking, eating a little more meat and vegetables and whatnot. Uh, the mountain yards were very good fighters. Uh, I, I don't, I, you know, it's mixed feelings about Vietnam. I just wish people would tell this true story in the history books, though. You know, they sugarcoat it and everything, and they make Johnson to be some kind of a hero. He was a total jerk. I mean, that guy, he was a typical Texan with a big hat and a swollen head. He didn't want to admit defeat to nothing. So he just kept sending more and more troops out. Let them all die. I'm not going to admit defeat. So, I mean, uh, I, 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 there was so many people just killed there needlessly, only because it was politics, nothing but politics. But, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't regret going there. I have a guy that I grew up with, he went to Guam, and some guys went to Germany. And yeah, I can say I don't regret going there because I came back in one piece. but. Uh, I tell you what, it, it does wake you up to the other side of life, you know, and, and it's interesting, the, the Vietnamese people, you know, it's just, the first thing you got to get used to going is there's no bathrooms there now. So when you're going down the street and Mama San wants to take a, a leak or something, they just squat in the street and go, and that's it. I mean, this, <laughs> this is like everyday occurrence, so it's the first thing you get used to, you know, like you go by a certain field there, and it seemed like noontime, everybody was out there squatting, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that, <laughs> that, 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 that's what I mean, it's a, it's a learning experience. It's something that you, you have to experience that they actually see it. There's other things, ways people live, and what they do. Yeah, I can't think of. Um, it's pretty good. I mean, you told us a lot. I mean, there were a lot of fun things that happened. One of the funny, not funny, one of the scariest things that happened. We were on a bridge, a stone bridge, mind you, arch bridge, and we're crossing this thing. And I'm in a field service truck because it's like a little contact truck with four wheels on it, you know. And uh, and now these wheels are the width of this bridge, and I'm not talking guardrails or nothing. It's like down 50 feet to a lake or a river, you know. And this idiot behind me, there's a, a, some Vietnamese guy down there in a boat and he's trying to fish, right? 
So he says, well, I'm going to throw a hand grenade down there and kill some fish for him. Well, the stupid moron throws the, the hand grenade out of the truck and it lands at the base of the bridge. I thought I was going to die. The whole bridge went like this, you know, and we're in the middle of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> you dummy! <laughs> so there was there was some things that were just so ridiculous. I mean, the stupid things that happened, and it was kind of like took the edge off of stuff. Um, trying to think of some other ones. There was so many. I had a dog with us. There's a lot of pictures of him in there. We call him Deadline, and. Uh, Dumbest dog you ever did see, but he was our mascot. We go through, see over there, if you're a dog, you're the number one meal. Because the Vietnamese, when they saw a dog, he was on the plate the next day or the next night, you know. So he would ride right on the front of a truck. And there we have windshields. We didn't have windshields. They were kind of like laid down. And this dumb dog would just sit right on the front of this thing. And he'd go sailing along. And he's, he's like just, you know, like a hood ornament, you know, trying to stay on there. He wouldn't come in the cab. The dumb thing's got to stay on the front of the truck. I don't know how many times he went flying when I hit the brakes, but everybody has to have a mascot. Then we had a monkey. This guy had a stupid monkey. I told, and there's pictures. I got him in there. Pictures, stupid monkey. I never liked the monkey, anyways. And but and uh, you could come back to the hooch and I hear the monkey crapped in your bed. You know? Well, I mean, that's not you know monkey crap is not something that smells very good either. So anyways, this one day, one guy told him, he says, that monkey craps in my thing, I'm going to shoot that damn thing. You know, well, sure enough, he can, a monkey crapped in his bed. The monkey was up on, a, you know, like big beams, 12 by 12 beams. A monkey said, the guy came in there, <laughs> he just, all he did was, there was fluff and guts and hair everywhere, you know, but there was no monkey, I guarantee you that. It was... <laughs> We were in a crane one time. I thought, I was another time I was scared to death. We're in the back of a crane working, and we're in the bottom of a, of a, a it's like a waterfall, and it's all rock, and we're setting up this crane because that's where our quarry's going to be, and there's like jungle things all the way up the thing. All of a sudden, we hear all this ruffling of the thing, and we thought, oh, geez, here comes the NBA through the jungle, and we're sitting in this stupid crane, like, and the guns are in the truck, you know, whatever it is. So we're covering, we're hiding in there and whatnot. And I said, wait, that don't sound right, you know? So I peek out and I look, and here's this whole horde of monkeys, and they're coming down, swinging on these trees and everything, and the one monkey, he falls. I mean, these are big monkeys. That thing fell off this cliff, went like 50 feet, landed in the rock, jumped right up and climbed just like this, right back up the hill again. I thought, geez, what do you make, super monkeys here or something? <laughs> it, was, it was just a lot of weird things. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I don't know, I just, I can't think of any answers. That's, that was pretty good. Yeah, that was a great interview. <laughs> There's some things, uh, I made a list of something. Like I tried, I tried to think of all the funny things, you know, because, I mean, you have to have funny stuff in order to have a, a Yeah, the asphalt platoon. That was good. That's another one. You know what happened to the asphalt platoon? These guys sat so high one time that uh, they didn't. Oh, there's another one I got to tell you. Uh, you got time? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> the they had the one guy. There was an air base down the road, and a guy wanted to go to the air base because air base. Believe me, people. You were in the Air Force. You were in Vietnam. You might as well be in America. They had air-conditioned trailers. They had the best of everything. I mean, we didn't have nothing. They had movie theaters. They had everything. We didn't have nothing, you know. So this guy wanted to go down. This was kind of like a sad thing, too. Um, he went over there, and they wouldn't let him go to the, na the air base. So the guy was all high on weed and everything like that. So in the middle of the night, I go out, and they had our potable water, which is drinkable water. We had a little 55-gallon drum, so I go out there, and I go get some water. All of a sudden, <laughs> Tracers are going like this in front of me. I thought, Holy moly, we're come, we're, they're over the fence, you know. So I crawl back in there. Everybody locks and loads. We're all out there shooting at anything that moves. And I mean, you know, everybody was shooting at any shadow they could see. And it turns out that this guy was shooting at the 
commanding officer's hooch, which was right in line between me and the, and the, or the water thing. He was shooting past me into there. And it turned out what he did is he killed a SEAL and he shot the arm off of the, the, the first sergeant. And only because they wouldn't let him go to the, the Navy base. But that was one of the scariest nights. I, truthfully, that was one of the scariest nights because everybody was shooting at everybody. And I mean, it was like no holes barred. You just held the gun up, you know, and you just, you just sprayed. And, and here we are shooting at ourselves. And uh, finally, some guy got on a bullhorn and said, stop it, stop it. They're, 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 you know, we're shooting at each other. So that was, uh, that, was, that was the closest I came to really getting hit. That was, that was really scary. But we had a weather. I don't know if they ever, anybody in Vietnam told you about monsoons. You know what a monsoon mm -hmm. is? Like, you don't dry out. It rains, rains like season. six weeks. You, you can't vision what a monsoon is. It's just like rains and rains and rains and rains and rains. You're just wet all the time. And then, and then the rest of the year, you just bake. Because, well, we had this, this black guy. He was our sergeant in charge of our, our four guys. I swear, I would go to hell and back for this guy, Sergeant Dwyer. He, is, he was the greatest of the greatest. He is a southern draw. Um, he looked out for us. He was smart. He was intelligent. He was. He had more ideas. He was just the greatest guy. I mean, I had the greatest respect for this guy. And um, so one day he says, "John, he said, I gotta get a. You better get things packed up. We got a tycoon coming." And I says, "Well, so what?" I says, "You know, we we always hide things that we weren't supposed to have on the shelves because we, when we ordered something, it was Red Ball Express." came with a big red ball on it. It was a court-martial if you didn't use that part because that part came by a private plane to Vietnam and landed somewhere and brought it to you from Guam or Philippines or somewhere. So anyways, I thought that's what he's talking about because if you got caught with that, you're in trouble. He says, oh, John, you got to get all this stuff packed up. We've got a tycoon coming. And I says, <laughs> like, <laughs> and I says, I don't know. I saw so, so some big shot. Who cares about him, you know? He says, no, come here, come here, tycoon. And he's pointing out to the Indian Ocean, it's a typhoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I says, you're not typhoon. He says, yeah, tycoon, you know. <laughs> so I says, well, <laughs> well, let's get the hell out of here. If you've ever been a typhoon, you'd know why. You could stand right here, and by that door, it's just like being underneath a waterfall. But yet there's a drop of rain on top of you. And when that thing comes through, I mean, it's just like, like when those tsunamis go through. I know a typhoon is nothing to screw around with. That was a, one of the weirdest things. And then we had a, another weird one was we had a, this rock. We drove through Central Highlands. Supposedly it was a big Viet Cong base at the bottom of this huge rock. Everybody went up and shot at this rock. I mean, I'm talking a thing that's like 1,000 feet tall. It's a big boulder in this mountain. And... Uh, Everybody shot it, all the artillery, everything. They, 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 there were more scars on that rock than you can imagine, and nothing ever came of it and whatnot. So one day, we're, we're working on this stuff, and, and I hear this, what the hell is that? You know, and I look inland, and all of a sudden, there's a huge explosion up by the rock, up on a mountain. Well, here was the Battleship New Jersey. And the Battleship New Jersey, I believe, has 16-inch guns. He's 10 miles out to sea. And the rock is like 20 miles inland, and he fires us. So we go out there and we watch, and here's this thing. You can see when he fires it, you see the flash, and you wait about 15 seconds, and then you hear this jump, and that's that shell going over your head, and then it hits somewhere inland, and then you can see him open the breach. You see the big white clouds come out of the breach, so that means they're opening it up, and they're going to put another round in. So you could just time this whole thing. It's like poetry in motion. It still did nothing to that rock. That damn rock is still sitting there <laughs> to this day. <laughs> Those 18-inch shells didn't even phase it. So I don't know how far that thing went into the ground, but uh, that was quite a thing. I've never seen it. I've never seen a New Jersey fire, but that was something. To hear those shells going over, you could almost see them. They were unbelievable. But other than that, I, I think I just that's pretty much everything I could think of that was, uh, you know, that. Uh, Like I say, the bad thing is, is that you know now all this Asian orange stuff is finally the VA is um, 
is finally admitting that the Agent Orange has done more damage than what they thought it did, and that's a sad part. You know that, uh, and that they're dragging their feet, and like this guy in the Tribune, if you saw that article, his two kids had the same nervous disorder that he had. They don't get any disability at all, nothing. Now he dies, and what little bit they give him, that's it. And those kids are left alone like that. So, what can I say? <laughs> all right, thanks for coming out. That was okay. a very good interview. That was a good interview.